Hi, I'm Brennan Fessler. And I'm Taylor Gertz. And we're the co-founders of Mordax. And today we're excited to show you something we've been working on for some time now. The Mordax Data. The Data is a 16 HP Eurorack module featuring a powder-coated aluminum faceplate with silkscreen graphics. The Data screen is a 2.8 inch full color display with a crystal clear, precision fit, scratch resistant protective window. There are four input jacks, each with buffered through outputs below them so that any signal patched into the data can be patched right back out with no loss in signal. On the right side, there are four output jacks with two clock gate outs and two wave CV outs. The data's firmware is user updatable via the included micro SD card, which means that we can continue to add programs and functionality to the module over time. And the data is now available for limited pre-order on our website, mordax.net. In designing the data's oscilloscope, we tried to replicate the functionality of a bench scope. And to show this, we've got a camera on our Rigel DS1074Z down in the corner showing the same signal that the data is monitoring, which are waveforms from an IntelliGel Dixie 2 oscillator. Each of the four display channels visibility can be turned on and off, and you get control over their scale and position. You can also select AC or DC coupling per channel, which toggles a DC blocking cap in the input path. Now let's change the scale so the sine wave on channel 1 is larger. And we'll do the same over on the Rigel. The scope can trigger off of any of the four input channels, with user-definable trigger voltage level, as well as whether the trigger occurs on the rising or falling edge of the waveform. The time scale of the scope's display is selectable. You can set the scale down to 50 microseconds per square and up to 5 seconds per square. And the scope's capture can be paused and re-enabled via the run stop button. Another feature of a bench scope that we want to replicate on the data scope is a proper measurement cursor. If we'll turn on the Rigel's cursor, you can see the same on the data scope. The y-axis cursors measure the voltage, with a difference between the AY and the BY cursors displayed below their position values. The x-axis cursors measure time and work similarly to the y-axis regarding their difference. You can see on the Rigel the cursor display with the measurement positions and deltas in the top left corner of its screen. Similarly, you can turn on the cursor display on the data and the cursor values and deltas will stay on the screen while you are able to enter other sub-menus. One of the really useful things about having a 4-channel oscilloscope is the ability to see a complex CV and audio control pathway. For example, let's look at a square wave from the Dixie 2 that has its frequency CV control coming from one side of a Make Noise Maths 80 envelope, with the other side of the Maths 80 envelope controlling the amplitude of the oscillator via a Moleco VCA. The last channel of the scope is the VCA's output, the final audio that you hear. So we're triggering off of channel 2 on the scope, the rising edge. Let's switch that to falling. Now let's do the same on the Rigel. You'll notice the same shift in the waveform. You can see the square wave's frequency increasing as a result of the envelope's rise in voltage. 
Note the VCA control envelope, channel 3, is just a line, it's flat. There's no amplitude modulation yet. The oscillator is coming out continuously at full volume. Now let's add some contour to the VCA control. You can see the amplitude of the final waveform is shaped by the mass envelope. The channel 3 LED line is shaping the channel 4 yellow waveform. So here we can view a waveform, its pitch control, its amplitude control, and the final audio that you hear, understanding the relationships between all of them. A four channel scope is a really good way to understand how a module works and how a CV control works in a module system. Now let's take a look at the data's tuner program. Here we have a square wave from the Dixie 2 and a saw wave from the Tip Top Z3000 going into channels 1 and 2 of both datas. See how the nearest note and its frequency is shown in the middle of the tuning bar with the next notes on either side of the bar, while the measured frequency is large numerals below. So we've got the Dixie at E5, now let's switch to the Z3000's channel and tune it to E5 as well. Now let's check out the data's spectral programs. First, the spectral analyzer, a FFT-based display that shows you the frequency components of a signal, that is, the harmonics that make up a sound. Here we have a sine and a saw wave from the Dixie 2 going into the data running the scope, and then from its through outputs to the right data running the spectral analyzer. Here you can see the sine wave on channel 1 has a single harmonic, switch the saw input on channel 2, it has multiple harmonics. The FFT has user-selectable window types, which are like filters, named after the smart folks who invented them. In the top right corner, you can see the peak bin frequency of the FFT, the first harmonic, which corresponds to the tallest bar of the graph. Next, we'll look at the spectral graph, which shows the output of the FFT over time. Each column of pixels on the spectrograph x-axis represents one frame of the FFT analysis that we saw on the spectral analyzer. The same saw wave is being displayed on both modules. Here you can really see the effect of the Han window tightening the spectral bands of each harmonic. As with the scope program, the spectrograph has run-stop control as well as a clear for clearing out the display's drawing. One really cool thing that you can see with the spectral graph is the changing of harmonic content during frequency modulation. Here we have the linear FM increasing on a Z3000 saw wave. Note the linear shift in frequency. Then at low frequencies, you can see the modulating wave come through, which is a Dixie sine wave. Here's the exponential FM, a very different pattern in sound. In addition to the data's visualization and measurement programs, it also produces signals. The first of which we'll look at is the dual waveform generator. Here we can see oscillator 1 triggering the left data's scope input, a plus 5 to negative 5 sine wave. The amplitude of the waveform can be scaled around the offset value. Here we're scaling the wave to half amplitude, giving a 5 volt peak to peak wave. And by moving the offset, the wave is now centered around 2.5 volts, producing a 0 to 5 signal. 
This is very handy for using the waveform as a CV source, such as an LFO. So here are the familiar waveforms, sine, square, saw, and triangle. The amplitude control can add gain as well as attenuate. The gain can clip the waveform, changing its shape. In this case, the saw is now a trapezoid. Now let's take a look at the phase and frequency controls. Here we have both oscillators shown on the left data scope. Oscillator 1 is the scope trigger. The waves start at the same frequency and phase, and their combined signal is on channel 3 in red. As we change the phase of oscillator 1, you can see the waves separate and the combined signal changing in amplitude due to phase cancellation. Frequency of the waveforms can be changed by selecting and scrolling any numeral of the frequency value, which allows for quick and precise frequency control. The frequency can also be selected by note value via the note mode. We'll put oscillator 1 in note mode. Now while we scroll the frequency, we're moving in semitones, with the note name and frequency displayed. The data's oscillators are of course also CV controllable, with the amplitude and frequency being able to be modulated by any of the four input jacks. The CV control for amplitude is essentially a digital voltage controlled amplifier. Here CV2 is controlling oscillator 1's DVCA, a maths AD envelope. Now let's control oscillator 1's frequency with the CV1 input which is hooked to the pitch output of an audio damage sequencer 1. Now let's switch the frequency to the CV2 input. Now the maths AD envelope is controlling both the pitch and the amplitude. The data's clock program provides an independent two-channel clock source with selectable and CV controllable divisions and multiplications as well as offsets of the clock signal. The clock can be generated either internally or synced to an external clock signal with a high degree of precision. In external sync mode, the clock program shows the user-definable pulse per quarter note of the incoming clock signal at the top. Once the data locks on to the incoming clock signal, the BPM is displayed. Also, note the frequency and period of the clock pulse shown below the BPM. The three color display bars in the middle of the screen show the clock pulses per measure. The top bar is the incoming clock pulse resolution. In this case, with four PPQN, there are four pulses. The next two bars are the data clock output resolutions, which change based on the selected clock division multiplication values as well as their offsets. In external sync mode, the CV input jacks 1 and 2 are used for the external clock signal and reset signals respectively. Let's take a look at the clock in action. This complex patch requires some explanation. The data clock program is externally synced to the audio damage Seq1. The Seq1 is triggering a 4-4 bass drum made by the self-resonance of the Maleco dual Borg filter. It is also triggering a square FM pulse on the first beat of the measure from the tip-top Z3000. The data clock 1 is triggering a maths envelope, which is controlling a VCA, passing the output of an audio damage Mad Hatter module. Note as we change the div mult of the clock, the clock's one position relative to the seek one's measure rotation is retained.
Similarly, the one is retained as we start and stop the sequencer. The offset control shifts the beat of the output clock pulse plus minus 96 steps in either direction. Now let's add some CV control to the clock and take a look at the data's latest program, which is still in development, the voltage monitor. The voltage monitor displays the four input jacks voltage levels like a simple scope with the current voltage displayed as a number in each channel's header. At the bottom of the screen is the voltage output controls. By tapping either of the gate buttons, a momentary pulse is sent out of the data clock outs 1 and 2 respectively. We have plans for adding latch modes to these as well. Lower buttons 3 and 4 operate the user-defined CV output voltages, which are sent out of the data wave outputs 1 and 2. So in this next demo, we add clock 2, which is triggering a VCA that passes a Dixie square wave. The Dixie's pitch control is modulated by a data oscillator acting as an LFO, a clip saw wave that you see on the voltage monitor screen, channel 1 in green. Adding CV control to clock 1, CV channel 3 is a maths envelope, which you can see on the voltage monitor channel 3 in red. The incoming CV is working off the divmult setting of times 32 with the final clock resolution value in gray next to the time 32 value. It's changing along with the rising envelope. Now let's use the gate output of the voltage monitor program to turn on and off an audio damage A verb on the main audio track. This gate is being monitored for display as well on the display's channel 4 track. Two CV outputs are connected to the Mad Hatter's crossfade and high pass filter CV ins. Well, there was a brief look at some of the data's many functions. And if you like what you've seen, head over to the Mordax website, mordax.net, and you can pre order the data now. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for a lot more exciting instruments from Mordax in 2016.